I'm super excited about this message. This whole theme this Christmas has been called a timeless hope. And how many know that nothing affects God? How many believe that nothing affects God? And I really believe that today when you leave here, you're going to leave inspired, motivated, and, uh, and hopefully come to the place where you stop thinking that I can't wait for 2020. I can't wait for that new year. So often people think that a new year is going to make a new you. Let me tell you something. A new year does not make a new you. A new you will make a whole new year. But we got to come back to the place of hope. Everybody say hope. And so I'm going to share with you just a little bit about what God thinks about this hope. And one thing that we know is that God keeps his promise always. God's not a man that he lies. He is a promise keeper. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 6, verse 13 through 15. You can look up on the screen if you like and uh, follow along. This is the most, one of the most greatest uh, 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 scriptures you'll find in the Bible. Look at this. It says, now when God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater than himself to swore, he swore an oath on his own integrity to keep, look at this, to keep the promise as sure as God exists. So he, 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 he said, have no doubt, I promise to bless you over and over and give you a son and multiply you without measure. So obviously he's talking to Abraham. Abraham is in a hopeless situation. Why? Because God tells Abraham, Abraham, you are going to be the, the father of faith to the nations. You're going to be the father of faith. Abraham's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute, God. How do you even think to call me a father when I've never been able to have any children my wife can't have children we're of age we're old how is that even possible so God makes a promise for him and he says verse 14 so he said have no doubt I I I promise to bless you over and over again and give you a a son and I'm going to multiply you without measure so Abraham waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled so God gave his word when he made his promise he wanted to make it very clear that his purpose does not change. Aren't you glad that you change, but God never changes? Because, come on, some of us, one moment we're for God, the next moment we're against God. One moment we believe God, the next moment we're like, where are you, God? He says, my purpose does not change. He wanted those who would receive what was promised to know this. When God made his promise, he gave his word. Have you ever given your word to someone and then you break your word? Let me say that again. Have you ever given your word and then you've broken your word? Okay, well, guess what? God doesn't break his word. When God made his promise, he gave his word. He did this so that we would have a good reason not to give up. Instead, we have run. We have to run to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope is set before us in God's promise. So God made his promise and gave his word. These two things can't change. He couldn't lie about them. Our hope is certain. It is something for the soul to hold on to. It is strong. It is secure. It goes all the way into the most holy room behind the curtain. Aren't you glad that God is, he's sure about what he says. A lot of times I talk to people and you know what, they're trying to butter me up. And honestly, I walk away thinking like, man, I'm not really sure about them. Have you ever walked away like that with someone? Like, I don't know, man, you got a lot of lip. A lot of talk, but I don't know, man. It just doesn't line up. God's saying, hey, when you, when you know that I promise, when you know that I give you something, when you know I give you a future with hope, I'm telling you, I don't lie. I want you to know that my promise is secure. My word is good. Take my word at face value. So as I was studying this, these scriptures to prepare for this message and to talk about hope, Abraham did three things to keep hope for a promise. Three things is what he did, and these are three things that you and I can do. This is based out of these verses. The first thing he did is that he didn't doubt God's word. So often we read the word or we hear the word, and sometimes it's a little bit difficult to connect with it, maybe because you're in a hopeless situation in your marriage, maybe because you're in a hopeless situation with your children, whether it's your physical health, maybe it's relationally, maybe at work, maybe your career is not at the greatest place you want it to be. Maybe there's some things that you're dealing with right now that keep bring, bringing all kinds of doubt. Like there's a moment you hear a message like what you're hearing tonight. And for just that little moment, you're like, okay, I can see God doing something. Oh, my God. Okay, I can see that I can get some hope right now. But for some reason, the moment you walk out these doors, you go back to reality. And reality starts telling you, you know what? 
I don't think anything's going to change. That's where doubt comes in. So Abraham said, I'm not going to doubt God's word. Are you hearing me? So if God said it, so be it. Say that with me. If God said it, so be it. In other words, if, if God, that's how you got to know God's word because you don't know what he said if you don't know his word. So if he said it, so be it. And I'm sure there's going to be times where Abraham in this scripture had to remind himself of what God said. I'm sure he had moments of doubt. Yes, he was the, the father of faith, but I don't care how much faith you have. We all hit those places of doubt, every single one of us, including myself. But I thank God that when I hit those places of doubt, I always remind myself of what God said. The second thing he did, and this is, listen, this is the cuss word in the church. He waited patiently. Have you noticed that we are a microwave generation? Like when you hear a word, you're like, God, do it right now. And we want it like yesterday. But I have learned throughout the years that when God makes a promise, God has to bring that promise through a process. It's, it's a process. Why? Because if God's going to give you something, if God's going to do something amazing in your life, it's not going to be a half thing. God's going to do something incredibly amazing. While we want microwave, I have learned that God, His, His promises are more like banana leaves that are wrapped around some tamales. They got to be steamed for a long time. Anybody having tamales this Christmas? Yeah? You know what I'm really... What I, what I get really get shocked about is when I start seeing white people making tamales. <laughs> but it's the most coolest thing. I'm like, wow. I'm like, man, there's hope for this world. <laughs> but, but listen to me. Listen to me. He waited, patient, he waited patiently. He waited patiently. There will be moments where you want to give up. There are going to be moments where you feel you want to give up. There are going to be moments where you're going to have an emotional moment where you want to give up. But the truth is this. If you give up, the guarantee is it will not happen. It is a guarantee. If you decide to give up, I promise you, God promises you, it's not going to happen. We read the verses there. He said, I gave you hope so that you wouldn't give up. I am your anchor so that you don't drift away. And so here you have Abraham saying, I had to learn how to wait patiently because there was moments where he felt like he wanted to give up, but that's the guarantee of quitting, okay? That's the guarantee of quitting. When you want to quit, it is guaranteed you're not going to see the promise. I'm not trying to, you know, bring you some bad news. I'm bringing you some good news. Don't give up. The third thing he did was this. He used this faith. Everybody say faith. He used his faith in God's word. He didn't use his faith out of nothing, right? You read Hebrews 11, 1. So then faith, cut, well, he, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing the word and hearing by the word of God. And then you go to Hebrews 11. It says, it says and uh, uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. And so we have to come back to that place where we're saying, okay, if faith is the substance of things hoped for, then I have to understand that hope is the foundation to my faith. Amen? Hope is my substance. And so here you have Abraham. He used his faith in God's word to succeed in seeing the promise fulfilled. In, in life, here's the reality. Everyone has a turnaround moment, all of us. Maybe right now you're at a place where you feel completely hopeless. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's your job. But Maybe it's just you. Maybe internally there's some stuff inside of you that you know you need to change. But guess what? There is hope for you. There is hope for me. We can all have a turnaround moment and begin to progress, begin to grow, and begin to change. But we need faith and trust in God's word. Once you get God's word, I'm telling you, he starts giving you some wisdom. Now, mind you, I'm not asking you to put your faith in man's word. I'm asking you to put your faith in God's word. That's where you draw your faith from. Look at Proverbs 13, 12. It says, hope deferred makes the heart what? It says, but when the desire comes, it is a what? Tree of life. So in other words, hope deferred means you keep putting it off. In other words, it's the people that start throwing up their, their shoulders. Kind of, have you ever seen someone be like, I don't care. I don't care. Who gives a rip? And they start having these horrible attitudes. Let me tell you something. That is called Hope deferred, and that's how your heart gets sick. 
Now, how do I get out of this hope deferred? It says, but when one desires, come on, desire is a gift from God for you. God's not going to desire it for you. You have to have your own desire. Like, for example, you being here tonight, that was your desire. You made a desire decision to say, you know what? It's Christmas Eve. I'm going to go worship God tonight. And let me tell you something, that desire is going to bless you for having that desire. And so I love it because if you keep putting off things, if you keep putting off hope, that is called hope deferred and you become sick in your heart, you become sick in your mind. As a matter of fact, it also affects your body as well. You start wondering, why am I always getting colds? Because you know what? Because you keep deferring hope. No, hope is now. God has hope for every single one of us now. So how do I, how do I start seeking this desire well you got to start seeking jesus you got to start seeking his word you got to open his word you got to you have to have a desire to say god i want to get closer to you i want to know you just a little bit deeper i don't want to have this superficial type of christianity i don't want to have this superficial type of relationship like i really want to know you god and it starts with that little desire it's called that little mustard seed of faith where you're like god i need to know you i want to hear you i want to know your plan for my life and let me tell you something god is awesome he'll always show up but it's in the season of waiting that we can develop that negative attitude isn't it man when you're having to wait come on I think so often we think that hope is defined as expectation. No, it isn't. Hope is not expectation. Hope is you and I saying, I'm putting my faith in God's word, and I know that God's word is going to bring whatever hope and desire I have, that's what's going to come to pass. And so in the season of waiting, it's so easy to develop a negative behavior. It's easy to develop a negative outlook it's easy to develop a negative outcome. If you're always being negative, negative about the situation, you're being negative about what it looks like, you're being negative in your behavior, well, guess what? You're gonna, you better expect some negative outcomes. It's just gonna happen. And sometimes it feels like, God, what the heck? Why, why do I feel like my, my plans are not working? Why do I feel like my dream's not happening? God, why, do, why isn't my family getting healed? God, why, why aren't my kids coming back to Jesus? God, why, why is my health still deteriorating? And we can get into this hopelessness. We can get into this place of feeling negative about the situation instead of hanging on to the anchor. Who's Jesus? He's the anchor. I love this. Mary and Joseph is a perfect example. Mary and Joseph, if you think about it, like many of us, they already had a plan for their life. Like some of you already have, you, 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 you had some plans about your life. There's some things that you wanted to do in your life. Maybe in 2019, there are things that you wrote down, like you wanted to buy that car. You wanted to get that house. You wanted to see your family together. You wanted to see unity. You wanted to see healing. I don't know what you what you were believing for, but maybe it didn't happen. And you just feel a little bit like, man, God, you've abandoned me. You've left me. God, I don't even know if you're real. You start doubting. You start having all these feelings. Well, let me tell you something. People in the Bible had the same emotions you and I had. Mary and Joseph were not just Mary and Joseph and they were at a manger with Jesus. Let me tell you something. Before Jesus, Mary and Joseph had their own life. Think about it. They were already thinking about getting married. They were planning their wedding. They were planning where they were going to live. They were planning. I'm sure Joseph was planning where he was going to work. They were probably planning how many kids they were going to have. They were planning already. Hey, listen, you know, ladies, you love to plan your wedding, don't you? Okay. Well, let me tell you something. Don't you wish you were a Jewish person, a Jewish girl? Because in the Jewish custom, uh, when, when you got married, it would be a seven to eight day party. That's what I'm talking about. So Mary, you know, she was working her party, getting all together. And think about this. They had all these plans. They had all these dreams and all that got interrupted. And sometimes you think that your delay means denial. But delay does not always mean denial with God. There's just a waiting process sometimes. And sometimes the process sucks. You know why? Because it's not happening as fast as you want it. But how many know that God's ways are higher than your ways? How many know that God's thoughts are higher than your thoughts? Right? God's higher than you. He's higher than me. So often we want to trade in our plan, right? And we're thinking like, God, I'd rather have my plan than your plan. Though we have good plans, God has great plans. I'd rather have the great 
perfect plan of God. And so, yes, instead of them doing all this planning for, and for their dream wedding, for their dream life, I mean, they were already, they were hooked up. She was already, you know, she had the ring on everything. Like, they were going to get married. Instead, now, you know what they're doing? They're running for their life. They're hopeless. Let me show you quick. Matthew 1, verse 18. We're going to be leaving now. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother, Mary, and Joseph had promised to get married. Look at this. But before they started to live together, before they started living the dream, before they started living the plan, look at this. She became pregnant. By the power of the Holy Spirit, her husband Joseph was faithful to the law, but he did not want to put her to shame in public. In other words, that girl was a virgin, man. He never touched her. This guy was a godly man. But he did not want to put her out in shame in public, so he planned to divorce her quietly. Now, I don't know about you, but does divorce sound like that's a hopeful thing? That's a hopeless thing. That's a hopeless situation. But as Joseph was thinking about this, as he was thinking like, what the heck did Mary do? Oh, my God, I can't believe that all of our dreams are dying. I can't believe that the plans that I had for a better tomorrow are over. I can't believe I invested all this time in this relationship, and now I have to divorce her. That's pretty hopeless. But as Joseph was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, chill out. He said, don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. The baby inside her is from the Holy Spirit. She's going to have a son. You must give him the name Jesus. That's because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to bring about what the Lord had said would happen. He had said, though, look at this, through the prophet, the virgin is going to have a baby. She will give birth to a son, and he will be called Emmanuel. Come on. And that's found in Isaiah 7, 14. And that name, Emmanuel, it means God with us. Aren't you glad that God's not watching over us, but that God is with us? And I love this part. And once he heard the word of God, listen to me. Once he heard the word, like you tonight, once you hear the word, hopefully you wake up. It says, Joseph woke up. There's a lot of sleeping Christians in the church. And God's, and I'm not, trying, I'm not saying physically you're taking a nap. I'm talking about spiritually. There's a lot of sleeping giants. And God is saying it's time to wake up. It's the season to wake up. It's the hour to wake up. My plans are yes and amen. amen. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded. I wonder if you're going to do what the angel of the Lord's commanding you tonight. I wonder if you're going to do that. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded him to do. He took Mary home as his wife. And let me tell you something. I'm sure that even though he took her as his wife, even though he obeyed God and his voice and his word and the promise that God wanted, I'm sure that he still felt the process of pain and suffering and hopelessness. I'm sure the journey wasn't easy. Read your Bible. They were running for their life. Herod wanted to kill the baby. If he was going to kill the baby, he was going to kill the mom and the dad. So it wasn't amazing. It wasn't this amazing, perfect story. No, it was a perfect God with a perfect plan, with a perfect promise, but the enemy still wanted to destroy that. But when God puts his hand on you, he says, I will bless you. I will protect you. I will heal you. I will use you. So it's not just about God wanting to accomplish his plan inside of you. See, God put a dream inside Mary. And now she was supposed to birth this dream. God wasn't just wanting to do something in Mary and in Joseph. God wants to do something in you, but he also wants to do something through you. Because, because of their obedience, Jesus has saved the world. So I want, you to know about, I want you to know something. Your challenge right now, God's trying to bring hope, not just for you. Don't be selfish. Your hope is not just for you. Your hope should spill into other people. Man, I'll tell you this. Let me give you something sweet. Some of us aren't that good looking. We're not. Some of us need a little extra, extra, right? But when you get hope in your life, oh, my God, you're attractive. Man, there's something attractive with people that are hopeful. There's something, there's like, ah, there's like, there's an anointing. There's something special that just draws people like, man, but when you're funky, when you're weird, when you're just like, ah, when you got like a, Negative behavior, negative attitude. You stink. I've been like, ooh. You can look all fine in the outside, but man, if you're ugly in the inside, like, ooh, you ugly outside and inside. That's the worst part, right? 
So we also, listen to me, we also must patiently wait for a greater hope. Are you hearing me tonight? We must patiently wait for this. Our faith is being sure of what we hope for. Hope is the building block for faith. It's the foundation for faith. And faith is you and I taking the action. Amen? Faith is you and I taking that step and saying, okay, God, you said your word, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to do something with it. That's why next Sunday, I'm not waiting for 2020. I don't want our church to wait for 2020. I don't want you thinking, oh, I can't wait for the new year. Hey, listen, stop it. No. Be excited about today because no one's promised tomorrow. Today is enough. Come on, today, say today, I'm going to have the greatest hope ever because I desire to see God do amazing things in my life. Amen? Amen. Today. And we have an instrument. That's the cool thing. We have an instrument. I'm going to talk about instrument as you watch this video, but check this out. This is our instrument. Without this instrument, let me tell you something. We, we, we'll stay hopeless because you're trying to figure it out in your own intellect. Stop trading. Stop diluting faith for intellect. I love intellect, okay? I'm a pretty smart guy, and I'm not trying to be, you know, prideful. I am pretty smart. And I know I can figure things out. I'm very good at figuring things out. I'm very good at solving problems. But let me tell you something. I have learned that it's not greater than my faith. It's not greater than faith. I need faith in Christ Jesus. He's the only one who can rescue me. He's the only one who can save me. And that goes for you too.